Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. I'm on my new cam, my new computer. I have a brand new MacBook Pro. I feel like the video quality is worse than on my old computer from 2015. I feel like it looks blurry. You guys can let me know if you agree or if you feel like it's the same or if you feel like it's not noticeable, but I'm, mm. If you guys feel like it looks blurry or if you feel like there's like the quality is weird, I'm on a new computer. I'm in my exact same room. I have my exact same lights on. If I also feel like it looks blurry. I'm not sure what's the deal, what's going on. I will say that I think it's louder, which is good because I've noticed that sometimes you guys have complained about us, uh, some previous videos, the audio being quiet, which I agree with. My uh, old computer definitely had some type of like volume microphone issue. Um, so hopefully this is louder, but if it appears that the video quality is worse, I guess Apple also wants me to buy a fucking new camera as well. Uh, they just want me to buy all new shit. It's bad enough this computer didn't come with a fucking USB. I had to buy this fucking dongle. Whatever, we're off topic. So this video is going to be about a concept that I've been wanting to do a video on ever since my, my most recent videos, um, and even my older video. And I feel like... So I've been thinking about doing this video for a long time on, you know, quote unquote, what do I want? Because when those set of, every time those set of, of opinions or videos or how I feel about that comes out, there's always people that ask me all these questions like, well, what do you want? 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 Uh, I've touched on this in live streams. This was also something that came up when I did my old video on drug addiction rant. Um, and earlier today, I actually gave an interview to a girl uh, named Amber. Hi, Amber. Shout out to Amber if you see this. Um, and the interview was sort of on this kind of secondary wave of quote unquote Black Lives Matter and uh, the idea of so much of it as performative. Um, you guys know I have some older videos on faux activism and performative protest and rebranding. And we specifically got into, and this is why she reached out to me, is because we specifically got into branding and brands and corporations um, and capital, you know, sort of capitalist endeavors that uh, adopt protest language and um, especially protest iconography as a way to sell their products to try to say that they're standing in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and stuff like that. Um, even though, as we all know, there's huge problems with Black Lives Matter, the organization, absolutely. And we, I've also done videos on this previously. Um, I did one on brand blackface, which is what the video is called. I did one on the whole Pepsi um, debacle with Kendall Jenner, where they had a Pepsi commercial set out a protest where Kendall effectively ends racism by giving a fucking cop a fucking Pepsi. Ridiculous. Um, and so in my conversation with Amber, she one of the questions that she specifically asked me was, what do I want? What do I think that some of these brands and organizations could do? And she's talked about, you know, as she's been doing her research for this project she's working on, she's been getting so much pushback from back, pe back from people that is sort of like, well, what more do you want? You know, like they at least... They put the Black Lives Matter sign in the window. They at least acknowledge that there's a problem. They are spreading awareness. Like, what else do you niggas want? What more do you fucking niggas want? <laughs> it's really, whenever I hear this question, this is what I hear. <laughs> what more do you fucking niggas want? And what I say every time, and what, what's most likely going to be the title of this video, is that I want it to be fair. I want it to be fair. On my video on drug addiction rant, which of course I will include a link in the description box to all videos mentioned during this video, a lot of people were asking me, well, what do you want? What do you want? You want the white opioid addicts to go to jail? Like, you know, we learned. We're sorry that we had to fucking lock up all the fucking niggas for nonviolent drug offenses involving crack cocaine and marijuana, which is now essentially decriminalized. <laughs> And is a million, if not billion dollar industry that primarily white men are fucking getting fucking rich off of, right? And yet, 
Black Americans are still sitting in jail for nonviolent drug offenses, right? And even outside of marijuana, Black Americans are still sitting in jail for nonviolent drug offenses re regarding crack cocaine because we had like the war on drugs. And yet now there's this idea with the opioids, which are primarily white white people um, that are hooked on opioids, that oh, it's a mental health crisis, and you know we have to put them in rehab not criminalize them not lock them up in jail we need to provide them with support you know what do i want i want it to be fair so when people say to me like oh do you want them to lock up all the white people no i want you to let the black people out like and i do feel like anti-blackness which i've done several videos now on anti-blackness and anti-black american sentiment specifically Anti-blackness is so normalized. It is so normalized that it is treated as the default. It is treated as the norm. It is treated as like, it's not it's not something we can do. Like, why does your mind immediately go to, I want white people locked up instead of, no, I want the black Americans released from jail. It's because we already have in our mindset, like as if like niggas belong in prison, like as if that's where we are supposed to be, you know? No, I want it to be fair. Like. If, if drug addiction now is a mental health crisis, then all those fucking black crackheads that are in jail need to be let out of jail and they need to be put in rehab. All the nonviolent marijuana offenders need to be let out of jail, have their fucking um, entire records expunged, give them a marijuana license and let them start selling legally. Retroactively release these people. Or sure, yes, lock the drug, lock the drugged out opioid addicted ass white people up. Sure, lock them up too. That's fair. But I don't need or want necessarily them to get like let locked up. I want the black people to get let out. And it's like that is like there's a disconnect, you know, like I'm tired of one set of rules for niggas and another set of rules for everybody else. What do I want? I want it to be fair. When Amber asked me, what do I want from these corporations and these businesses and these capitalists that are co-opting protest language and iconography in order to sell, sell shit, which I am doing a full video on semantic leeching as well, which this is related to in addition to my previous fucking videos. And then people say, well, what's the problem? They're spreading awareness. Number one, we don't need any more awareness. <laughs> this is literally the second if not third like i said previously i would even call this the third wave of black lives matter the idea not the organization because you had like the trayvon martin in 2012 you had the mike brown in 2014 and now we have the sort of george floyd reckoning in 2020 and now it's fine third time's a charm i guess it's finally setting in for motherfuckers that anti-black racism is real it's a problem, you know what, not even, because now everybody's just like racism, everybody versus white supremacy. Like, and something that I also talked about with Amber was how, because Amber said that there are a lot of people that would say that it's fine for especially brands and corporations to utilize this language because it's not hurting anyone. Like a prime example of, of this, even using these words, everybody versus racism, right? I saw some quote unquote protest art that was made by a Southeast Asian, I believe she was a Filipino artist, and it said, everybody versus racism. Now this whole like blank versus everybody, that was created by Detroit versus everybody, which is a black American owned Detroit based brand. I've been to their store several times. I own a lot of their stuff. And when I saw that, my first thought, and they literally like, it wasn't even just that it said this like piece of art. It wasn't even just that it said everybody versus racism. Every single time you see any shirt, any anything that says like blank versus everybody, they got that from Detroit versus everybody. That was like a black American's idea. But this piece of like quote unquote protest art that I even saw, it had somebody wearing a shirt. And they have like this very specific like black. Ooh, the breeze just closed my window. Who's the ghost in here? It's the ghost of racism, anti-blackness in here. They don't want me talking. When you see it, it's like a very specific like block lettering that says like Detroit versus everybody. This shirt that said everybody versus racism, it was like that lettering, the shirt, it said everybody versus racism. And you guys know I have an issue with that because like my problem is not just quote unquote racism. My problem is anti-blackness and anti-black American sentiment specifically, which is not everybody's problem. There's very much a flattening right now that's occurring with all of our rhetoric and all of our language and the way that we're talking about 
race and racism and the system of racism, white supremacy and problems with this like POC wording and not wanting to talk about the the issue of anti-blackness specifically. And I even thought like, see, so now you have a POC that created some protest art that I'm sure they think is perfectly fine, but yet you stole this. <laughs> like you stole this, you stole this from the Detroit versus everybody people. Like those people did not get paid. Everybody's borrowed their language, borrowed their block letters, don't even know where it came from. And yet you say, well, it's our protest work and it's not hurting anybody. You took something away from them. You didn't, you didn't commission them to use their own slogan. You didn't pay them. You took money away from them. You are, you stripped their design from the context of them. It, it, it is hurtful. You took something. It is actively hurting people and it is actively sort of hurting the movements for several reasons. Number one, we have people that are co-opting protest language and iconography to make money, but they are not giving any thing back when you utilize all the protest language that has been created most likely by grassroots organizers on the ground that don't have any they don't have any infrastructural support they don't have any systemic support they don't have any monetary support and then you co-opt that language you're stealing <laughs> you're literally stealing you're literally stealing when we talk about oh we we want to people to support black owned businesses so we can circulate our dollar in our communities a little bit more and try to build up and support small businesses, local businesses, women owned, black women owned, black American owned, so we can try to do some job creation. Again, so we can circulate the money and able to, in, in order to create some of our own infrastructure in our own communities, which I've talked in depth in other videos, obviously I'll include links to that. So then you have, you know, so we, we have, for example, like, oh, we say, oh, go support a black owned coffee shop. But now Starbucks has Black Lives Matter sign in their window. And so now people think, well, I don't have to support the black owned coffee shop. I can support Starbucks. Now you're actively taking money out of the black community. Like you're actively, in a lot of ways, you're co-opting this language and you're actively working against the movement with this language because now you're removing you're removing from the community you're co-opting you're utilizing these things to make money for yourself but you're not putting anything back this again was what i also said about peter hernandez when people say well what do i want this man has a net worth of 175 million dollars you love the black American music so much. You love the Motown sound, the Detroit, the Chicago. You love all this stuff so much. The Jersey, the, the, the New Jack Swing, the funk. You love all this stuff so much. They're shutting down music programs in Detroit and Chicago and you see where I'm from. They're shutting down the art programs. They're, they're shutting down the schools. We don't have any infrastructure because they're constantly saying that there's not enough money. And yet you have musical artists, you have corporations, you have all these things People that are not even black Americans, people that are not even related in any way to our community, that they co-opt our culture, they co-opt our iconography, they co-opt all these things and they have millions, if not billions of dollars. What do I want? I want in like investment. Like you could invest. Like it's it's just it, it's definitely not enough. It's not enough to just put a Black Lives Matter sign in your window or just to like do a commercial, especially if the end goal of this is to make more money off of it. You could put money back in the black American community. I did a video on Nipsey Hussle shortly before he died. It had to be a week or two. The timing was like really creepy. Like where I spoke about how Nipsey Hussle, who was half black American and half Eritrean, made it his job after feeling like he actively took away from the community with his gang activities to invest and try to build up the community and try to put money back into the community and to try to teach people about ownership and financial literacy if that's the type of thing that you're into, which we do need because money talks and bullshit walks and our world unfortunately does run on capital. And some that's something that black Americans are owed as well. We are owed infrastructural support. We're owed monetary support. We're owed reparations. And even though, and people love to say they don't think the government is gonna give it to us and they don't think the government is gonna help us and you know, whatever. Well, that's fine too. If you don't think the government then is gonna help, then we should definitely at the very least start holding artists and corporations accountable for what they do or don't do. I want it to be fair. Cause I know there's also gonna be people that say, for example, well, it's not Peter Hernandez's job to single-handedly keep music programs going. That's the job of the government, which is a fair point. 
It is our government's job to invest black American infrastructure and pay back what is owed in the form of reparations. I, I totally agree. Yet if we're also going to talk about artists and companies and corporations that are now making money actively off of protest language and iconography and even on a, you know, a larger scale on a macro scale, black American culture, they should be required to give back. <laughs> and as an anti-capitalist, I feel this on a large scale. Like I'm in favor of a wealth tax. Like I think people that have a lot should have to give especially if they got that off the backs of black Americans, which pretty much everybody did. You should have to give back. In my interview with Amber, another example that I used was the 15% pledge, which was founded last year by Aurora James, who's the owner of Brother Veli's. I want to say she, I know she's Canadian, she's black, uh, but I want to say she's a Jamaican Canadian, like Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know, these Jamaican Canadians, they get it. Like, they get it. Like, But she started the 15% pledge where the backbone of the 15% pledge is that she says, you know, black people make up roughly 15% of the American population. And so we need to have at least 15% of representation everywhere, in every store, in every fucking business, on every show, in ev in everything. And so she, so she already had this huge fashion platform because of her uh, shoe company, Brother Veli's, which I have a pair of her shoes. I did do an unboxing on this channel. And so she utilized her huge platform as the owner of this shoe company. She's very much, you know, sort of like a fashion darling. Like she knows everybody. Everybody knows her. She's best friends with Elaine Walteroth, uh, who was the former editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, not the one that was just forced to step down. And have you guys noticed that Teen Vogue has been totally silent since it came out that the Asian girl, Christine Davis, said the N-word repeatedly. They haven't said nothing. They've been ghost on fucking Instagram for two weeks. They haven't been putting anything on Twitter. We had a whole, another mass shooting and they didn't say anything because they're trying to let it blow over. They're, they're not trying to address it because again, anti-blackness is normalized. <laughs> if you say something against some Asians, you gotta go. Fine. If you say something about some black people, we're just going to go quiet for a little while. Hope the niggas forget about it. Anti-blackness is normalized, as I continue to say. But Aurora James used all of her, you know, her sort of clout, I guess you could say, from running Brother Bellies to launch a secondary uh, platform called 15% Pledge, where she publicly, she publicly calls on major corporations and especially ones that are coming out with all these statements about how they want to support Black Lives Matter and da 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 da. She's publicly calling on them to allocate at least 15% of their resources, excuse me, towards black community. She's calling on them to allocate, well, what does your staff look like? Is 15% of your staff black? Oh, you, oh, you, uh, Target, Target is at least 15% of the wares on your shelves black? Publicly. They can do more than just putting some niggas in some fucking commercials. Not that I mind. It's nice seeing the commercials too. I love seeing the Honey Pot commercial too. But they can do more than just putting some niggas in some commercials and shit like that that will ultimately cause them to make more money. They can invest more money and more infrastructural support because this is what black Americans need. People love to say, like, well, again, like, they're, they're raising awareness. We don't need no more awareness. Again, it's been almost 10 years of, uh, of since Trayvon Martin and e even longer since we knew about slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, the war on drugs, the war on crime. F four years of Donald Trump. I don't, I, like, I'm really not buying that it's enough to spread awareness. Hopefully, e at this point, everyone's aware. And if you're not aware, well, you know, you're going to learn on your own pace Everybody has to learn on their own pace. But it's not enough to just be like, well, all they're, you know, it's good. It's good. They're spreading awareness. They need to also invest in infrastructural support of black American communities. That's what everyone needs to do. That's what I want. That's what I feel would be fair. And I want it to be fair and appropriate. They're about to pay out billions of dollars to white opioid addicts. Why are there black Americans still in prison right now for crack cocaine? And then people be like, well, those were the rules back then. Retroactively release them. I don't want to hear it. I want it to be fair. And you get so much pushback when you want shit to be fair. Like, I don't even want mo anything more than fairness. I just want what we are owed. Infrastructural support capital money from the people that make millions and billions of dollars off of black American labor.
Ooh, it sounded like slavery up in here. And even outside of, you know, words and awareness and tangible infrastructural support, there's literally a double standard. We were talking about this in Discord. I said, who remembers when people used to accuse Beyonce of plagiarizing and stealing? I know a lot of y'all are going to be too young to remember this, but this is a whole thing around the I am Sasha Fierce slash like four era, like the pop pop Beyonce, like pre uh, self-titled and like definitely pre lemonade and pre homecoming. There was like this constant chatter around Beyonce of Beyonce plagiarizing, that she's a plagiarizer, that she's a copycat. Beyonce steals routines. She steals this, she steals this, she steals that. For years, people had smoke for Beyonce being a copycat, right? There was a, like, there was literally a whole special on ABC about Beyonce being a copycat and how Beyonce stole her dance routine um, for the countdown video from some like random Eastern European artist. It was like a whole thing. That type of shit used to pop up for Beyonce all the time. Beyonce did a, a, a um, Audrey Hepburn like breakfast at Tiffany's moment in that video. People said, oh, she's plagiarizing. She's copying, right? For years, people called out Beyonce for this, right? Yet, Peter Hernandez can literally dress up like Trinidad James or Bobby Brown or Little Richard. You know, he can literally do tributes because all he knows how to do are tributes and covers. And he's a tribute artist, cover artist, wedding singer. It's wedding season! Anyways, he can literally dress up and it's fine. All he has to do is be like, I love black music. I love black culture. I'm paying homage, even though I'm not black. And everyone loves it. Everyone's going to eat it up. It's fine. But everybody had all this smoke for Beyonce and still do to this day. Beyonce can't do anything right. Right. And even back then, what happened? What did Beyonce do? After four, Beyonce actually took a break. She left for a little while and she came back with projects like self-titled, Lemonade, and Homecoming that were very unique, very original, and very creatively well received and still haven't won any album of the year Grammys, even though I don't care about awards. But there's a double standard. There's a clear double standard. They had a whole special on ABC about Beyonce being a plagiarizer and plagiarized, so-called plagiarizing this white woman. But like, we're not even allowed to talk about how people jack shit from black Americans and don't give anything back up to and including not only culture, but protest language and iconography to make money. And then when you say, well, this makes me feel uncomfortable, people get all up in your face. Like, well, what do you want? What do you want? They're at least acknowledging that you niggas have a problem. What more do you want? Anti-blackness is really normalized. It is so normalized. It's everywhere. It's pervasive. Black people can't even ask for fairness without people seeing us wanting fairness as an affront. Anytime anybody asks me, what do I want from Peter? It's like, what I want from Peter is what happened with Beyonce. Like, I want your faith to develop. Develop an identity, develop a sound. What is your perspective? What is your artistic identity? You know, why are you famous? You're famous for your retro showmanship. What does that mean? It's like a nice way of saying you like to dress up and perform as niggas, dead ones, old ones, obscure ones, ones that are too, too ghetto, you know? Like, you need to be known for something else. Discover yourself creatively and come back with some self-titled shit or, you know, or you're just not creative and you're gonna remain an artistically bereft shill that's fine people are gonna eat it up but like aside from that y'all fave needs to do something for black people period he got 175 million dollars he could single-handedly fund music programs you know and it's and it's not just him calvin harris who i've talked about recently changed his name to like love regenerator love refrigerator to me his real name is adam wiles Adam Richard Wiles, and he changed, he had the stage name Calvin Harris to black it up, literally. He was making black house music. House music is a black art form that has now been whitewashed into like electronic music, but house music is a black art form. Calvin Harris didn't want people to know if he was white or black, so he deliberately picked the name Calvin Harris because it sounded like a black name. Now he's changing it. Oh, I got some negative back backlash, so now I'm gonna change my name out of respect. Not only should you change your name, you should donate a portion of your entire life earnings to New Jersey house DJs that can't get put on. That's when I would really know that you are a quote unquote ally, even though I don't believe in those. That's what I want. Thug Kitchen, who I've hated for years, 
blacking it up in digital blackface for money. But now last year they came out, oh, we going to change our name. You motherfuckers are already fucking rich. You've already put out numerous cookbooks under this name. You know what you should do? You should take every penny of your earnings. And you should donate it to Bryant Terry, black fucking uh, chef who called your ass out. You should give that money away. We need more than just words and bullshit. Y'all made all this money off us. Y'all locked us up. We we like I said, it's like it's action too. Like this is what people don't seem to understand. All this shit is action. Cultural appropriation is action. Wherein somebody from a more dominant or acceptable group takes from a marginalized group and benefits from what they took in a way that the marginalized person cannot. When this comes, like Black Americans can't even be so. We can't even be so called inspired. Beyonce was inspired and they called her a plagiarizer or a copycat. We can't even be inspired by shit without people throwing a fucking fit. Meanwhile, everybody gets to get fucking rich off black American culture, off black American protest culture, academic culture, art, activism. Like, there's a systemic, again, infrastructural element to all this that people do not understand with regards to how systemic privilege works. People need to look at the systems and the infrastructure and understand that black Americans need systemic and infrastructural change, not just words. You guys know I hate rhetoric. I've said for years on this channel that I hate rhetoric. I'm going to be doing a full length video on the issues with rhetoric, something that Amber said really stood out to me today. She said she got in an argument with one of her professors because her professor said that, oh, words matter. Words are important. I'm a writer. Words do matter. Words are absolutely important. But you also need actual systemic infrastructural change. Like our problem is not just words. Our problem is not, you know, people act like, well, we can't call you the N word in public anymore. So racism's over. What's the problem? Like we have to use nice words when we talk to you guys now. What's the problem? We have an infrastructural and systemic issue. We have a capital issue that is what we need and that is what i want and i want it to be fair and you get such a pushback as a black american when you say this because again anti-black american sentiment is so ingrained that people what, what's that old saying like when you're used to everything people wanting equality feels like oppression that's really what it's like and i hate to even say ask because i'm not asking i'm gonna get it <laughs> I'm going to get it. <laughs> and that's what I want. That's what I want.